So welcome guys to experiment number two. Today's experiment is entitled using spectrophotometry to measure total protein concentration. Let's present this topic with a case study. Adam did a blood test as part of his routine health checkup. He just wants to check on himself, see his, if his blood protein concentration is okay. It was determined when he did this test that he had a high total protein concentration, that he had a high concentration of total proteins. Now, we know that the normal concentration of total blood, blood protein is between 6 to 8.3 grams per deciliter. However, Adam's concentration of uh, proteins was 12 grams per deciliter. This indicates that he has a case of hyperproteinemia, an increased or an abnormal increased amount of total proteins in the blood. How should the doctors proceed with this case? I want you guys to think about it for a few seconds and then we'll come back and discuss it. Please. Now, this indicates guys, this indicates that it needs to be dig, uh, dug deeper, that the person, this person, as a high total protein concentration, it could be due to liver condition. So it could be, he could have an increased amount of albumin, an albumin protein, or he could be dehydrated, or it could be a case of cancer. Because in cancer, you have an overexpression of a specific protein. For example, in prostate cancer, you have an overexpression of PSA. Okay? In prostate cancer, you have an overexpression of a protein or an oncoprotein called PSA. So the doctor has to dig deeper into this case in order to better diagnose the patient. Total protein concentration is not enough to diagnose the patient. He has to determine what protein is being overexpressed and of course do other analysis with it. So the big idea for today is to determine the concentration of proteins which will aid in the diagnosis of disease, for example, cancer. So what is spectrophotometry? Spectrophotometry, it's a quantitative measurement of how much a chemical substance absorbs light. So it's a quantitative, meaning it can be measured. Okay? Quantity can be measured. And we can take advantage of this to measure the concentration of molecules, for example, proteins. It doesn't have to be proteins, guys. It can be DNA, it can be amino acids, it can be carbohydrates, etc. cetera. Okay? And the key word here is concentration. Concentration means Okay, it means an amount, the amount of solute in a specific volume. The amount of solute in a specific volume. In a specific volume of solvent. And this can be measured in molarity, as indicated here. Just use my marker. So it can be in molarity, which is moles per liter, parts per million, another unit of concentration, milligrams per milliliter, which we'll be, we'll be using today, and also grams per deciliter, as you guys saw on the other slide, et cetera. So there are many units of concentration. And this occurs inside the machine by passing a beam of light or a ray of light through the sample using the machine, which is termed spectrophotometer. Now, the spectrophotometer, it uses electromagnetic radiation. And we know electromagnetic radi radiation, it ranges from radio waves to gamma rays. And we have in between the microwaves, infrared rays, UV light, and X-rays. Okay? We know that radio waves have low frequency and long wavelength. Gamma rays, gamma rays, they are the most energetic. They have high frequency and short wavelength. To measure total protein concentration, we use, one of the assays uses the 595 nanometer wavelength, which is in the visible spectrum. Okay, And we'll mention this later. This is part of an assay called the Bradford assay. We can also use UV light, specifically 280 nanometers. And there are many other assays that we did not mention in here. So how does the spectrophotometer work? How does it work? You have the machine, of course, but this is all invisible within the machine. So you have a light source, let's say a white light in here. The light is shown on a lens, shining on a lens. This lens, what it does is that it condenses the light towards the prism. And then the, the prism converts it, converts it into diff the different colors, converts white light into different colors. By the way, another word for the lens here is the 
collimator, the collimator. And then this monochromator, it allows one color, monochromator, to pass through, through a slit in here, which has a specific di diameter for that specific color. And then this light, specific light, it's the sample which is present in a cuvette. Our samples will always be present in a cuvette. And then the machine, this machine, compares the light that comes, that passes through, that is transmitted by comparing I, the intensity of transmitted light, versus I0, or I0, the intensity of incident light that hits the sample. Okay? So the higher the concentration, the higher this number is. The higher the concentration of your sample, the higher this number is. So this machine uses this formula here, the logarithmic formula. It compares the I versus the I0. For example, if I0, if there is no absorption, then I and I0 will be the same. Okay? And your number will be close, your absorption will be close to zero. Of course, if I is smaller than I0, then you have absorption. Okay? You have absorption. So as mentioned earlier, it compares I0 versus I. And the higher the concentration in the cuvette, the higher the reading in here. L here indicates the path, uh, the path of the light, which is from one side of the cuvette to the other. Usually it is one centimeter. Okay. And the detection limit of this machine based on this formula is between 0 0.1 and one. So it's only accurate between these values. If it's more than one, if it's more than one, it will not be accurate. The sample has to be diluted to bring it below now, what are the steps involved in finding the, wave, the right wavelength for concentration analysis? So let's say we discovered a molecule in the sea. Okay, we don't know what it is. We want to determine its concentration. So we scan the sample at different wavelengths. So let's say we scan the sample, this newly discovered molecule, 200 nanometer. We scan it at 250, 300, et cetera. We find that it has a maximum absorption at 350. So then we measure its concentration at 315 nanometers. In our case, in our case, we use 280 nanometer for total proteins or 595 nanometers because this is where they're uh, the total maximum absorption for proteins. Now, to measure the protein concentration, we use a formula. This is very important, guys. It's called the Beer-Lambert law. Okay, we use this law. It's called the Beer-Lambert law. So, what is this law? The Beer-Lambert law. The Beer-Lambert law, if you guys remember earlier in the last lecture, we mentioned the relationship between pH and H plus concentration, which is a proton concentration. We said this is an inverse relationship. As we increase the proton concentration, we decrease the pH because of the negative sign and vice versa. Here, we have a direct relationship between absorbance and concentration absorbance and concentration. As I increase the concentration, notice here there's no minus sign, so it's a direct relationship. As I increase the concentration, I increase the absorbance. And as I, of course, makes sense. As I decrease the concentration, I decrease the absorbance. The epsilon here and the L are constants. So let's look at this further. So A is absorption, has no units. Epsilon, Greek letter, epsilon, it's called the molar extinction coefficient, and this is a constant, an intrinsic to the molecule. So it means it's just the absorption of one molar solution at a specific wavelength, okay? And it doesn't have to be one molar, we can use other different units. So it's a constant. Concentration, okay, concentration, it can be in molarity, it can be grams per, uh, per milliliter, et cetera. And L is the length of the light path, which is usually one centimeter, it's usually one centimeter. So these are constants. So in this case, A, absorption, this is the dependent variable. C is the independent variable. You change the concentration, you increase the concentration, you increase the absorbance and vice versa. So how do we actually determine the total protein concentration? We're given an unknown a sample, unknown patient sample, we want to determine their total protein concentration to see if they have hyperproteinemia. So the first thing that we do, guys, is we make, we construct a calibration curve, or we also call it a standard curve, by measuring the absorption of known concentration standards. So we have standards, we prepare them in the lab. 
okay? Zero molar, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and one. We know for sure that they have this concentration. We make them in the lab. And this for the standards, we use a protein called BSA or bovine, bovine serum albumin. Again, I'll explain, it. I'll talk about it more later on. And then we measure the absorbance. So as you guys can see here, as we increase the concentration, we increase the concentration, we increase the absorbance. So this, of course, it follows the Beer-Lambert law. And then we can construct this standard curve. So as you guys can see, we have a straight line. As we increase the concentration, we increase the absorbance. Now, this line here, guys, is called a best fit line. You see here, some of the points are not perfect. So you have to draw the best line that fits the points. It's called the best fit line. Don't worry about this equation. Okay. And this is part of your assignment, guys. The first step is to draw the standard curve based on the results that you get in class. So make sure that when you guys label this graph, you have the title. So you have absorbance, absorbance at whatever wavelength you are using, in this case, 595 nanometer versus the concentration of the protein of the patient. Let's say patient X, patient A, B, C, et cetera. You have the absorbance. So on the Y axis, you have the absorbance at which wavelength are you using? In this case, 595 nanometer. And then you have the concentration, okay? And the unit, what is the unit? In our case, it's molarity in this example, but you will see when we do the experiment, it's a different unit. And then you have your X axis labeled and the Y axis is labeled. And very important here, guys, when you draw the axes, okay, the Y axis right here, the absorbance is on the left side, okay? I believe in Arabic, you guys write it here on the right side, but the Y axis should be on the left side here, okay? And then we have the X axis in here. Okay. So the Y axis should be here. Now, how do we determine so this is the most important part. How do we determine the unknown concentration of proteins, total proteins from the patient? So this works in the opposite direction. So the first thing that you do, you take the sample, you take the sample, and then you find the absorbance of the sample at 595 nanometers or whatever wavelength you are using. So let's say in our case, we measured the absorbance of the sample and it was determined to be 0.35. Then what you do is you go back to that graph and extrapolate. You go back to that standard curve or calibration curve and you extrapolate. What does extrapolate mean in this case? So you take the 0 0.35 guys right here, You take the 0 0.35, you go back to the original graph and then you draw a perpendicular line as indicated here. So you draw, you bring a ruler and you draw a line and you see the 0 0.35 absorbance, and you see where it hits the best fit line. This is the best fit line. Where it hits the line, then you can draw a perpendicular line towards the x-axis. And this will give you the value of the concentration of the unknown patient. And in this case, it's 0 0.86 molar, 0 0.86 molar. So this will be the total protein concentration of the patient. All right. So this is the concentration of the undiluted sample. Now, imagine guys, imagine that the patient sample, we got the unknown absorbance was 3.4. So this is above the limit. Remember guys, we mentioned that the limit of the machine is one. So this is way above the limit. It's inaccurate. So what do we need to do in this case? If we get an absorbance that is above one, above the accuracy of the machine, what should we do in this case? I want you guys to think about it. All right, guys, so if you get a value like that, what you have to do is you have to dilute it. You have to do trial and error dilutions, and you find, you find the dilution that will give you an absorbance of less than one, okay? Once you find that, you go to the graph, okay? So you go to the graph, and as indicated before, as shown earlier, and then you find the concentration. Once you find the concentration, then you multiply it by something called the dilution factor. How much you diluted by? You diluted it by. So you multiply that by the dilution factor to determine the concentration of the unknown sample, okay? So you have to multiply it by the dilution factor to determine the concentration of the original sample because the absorbance that you measured earlier 
this one will be the diluted. So you have to multiply that by the dilution factor, which will be explained to you guys in class in more details. All right, guys. So how do we measure protein concentration? One assay that we use is called the Bradford protein assay. The Bradford protein assay. It uses a special dye called the Kamasi Brilliant Blue G dye. That's a mouthful, lots of words in here. Reagent. Under strongly acidic conditions, the dye is most stable as doubly proteinated red form. So let's look at the picture here, guys. So under acidic conditions, under acidic conditions, this dye is red. It's present as a cation, and the absorbance is 470 nanometer. Okay, so this is under acidic conditions. No proteins are present. When you add a protein, when the protein is added, okay, it's most stable now as unprotonated blue form, indicated here, guys. It's present as an anion. So when a protein is present under acidic conditions, the protein okay, is bound to the dye, and it becomes blue. It becomes blue, and the absorbance becomes, it should be 595 nanometer, and the absorbance now is 500 we can measure the absorbance at 595 nanometer. Of course, the darker the blue, the darker the blue, the more total protein is present. The darker the protein, the darker the blue color, the more protein is present. Okay? So when a protein is bound, the dye turns into blue. And the darker the blue, the more protein is present. And we can measure this absorbance. We can measure the absorbance at 595 nanometer. So let me illustrate it here for you guys. So Kamasi blue, Kamasi brilliant blue, under acidic conditions, let's forget about the protein for now, under acidic condition, it's present in red color. It's at 470 nanometers. Now, when you add the protein, when you add the protein, it becomes blue, it becomes blue, and we can measure the absorbance at 595 nanometer. After 10 minutes, of course, we have to let it incubate for 10 minutes, and it gets, it turns blue. So turns blue, the, the darker the blue, the more protein is present. So you can see here, guys, here, we have added the total proteins. As we increase the concentration of proteins, we increase the intensity of the, of the blue color. Okay. So the darker the blue, the higher the concentration of proteins, the more there will be absorption at 595 nanometers. In the labs, this can also be done in a 96 well plate format. So here, the standards are prepared, as shown in here. Usually in the lab, guys, they do it in triplicates. Each sample is done three times, three times. That's why you see here the replicated and also the unknowns. Okay, And you can see here, as we increase the total protein concentration, we increase the intensity of the blue color. Of course, this will be measured at 595 and it's not working properly, 595 nanometers. Now, very exciting, experiment number two. The point of this experiment, guys, we want to determine the unknown concentration of total proteins from the blood of two patients, patients A and B, as part of the regular checkup, regular medical checkup. We're going to assume for this class only that the normal range of total proteins in the blood is between one to five milligrams per mil. So this will be our unit for protein concentration. Now, if this person has hyperproteinemia, its concentration of total proteins will be between six to 10, to 10 milligrams per milliliter. This will be our assumption. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to prepare protein standards to generate a calibration curve. And usually what people use, they use a special protein for standards called PSA or BSA, not PSA, BSA which stands for bovine, means cow, derived from cows, serum, albumin, BSA. And BSA is usually used because it's inert chemically. It doesn't react with many chemicals and it's highly readable. So it's highly uh, producible okay? and it's very cheap to use. That's why you use, they use it as a standard. And what you have to do guys first is to prepare these standards. So we're gonna prepare these BSA standards Zero, which will be your blank, your reference, 0 0.2 milligrams per milliliter, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and one milligram per milliliters. Okay, so this will be your standards. 
we will explain to you guys the procedure for this experiment and talk about it in more, more details in class. Good luck, everyone.